Chapter Seventeen of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Our Army at the Front by Hayward Brown. Chapter Seventeen. Our Own Sector. The Lunaville Sector was merely a sort of postgraduate school of warfare, but shortly after the beginning of 1918 the american army took over a part of the line for its very own this sector was gradually enlarged by the middle of april the americans were holding more than twenty miles the sector lay due north of toe and extended very roughly from saint michel to Pois de Maison. later other sections of front were given over to the americans at various points on the allied line perhaps there was not quite the same thrill in the march to the toe sector as in the earlier movement to the trenches of the Lunaville line. After all, even the limited service which the men had received gave them something of the spirit of veterans. Then, too, the movement was less of an adventure. Motor trucks were few, and most of the men marched all the way over roads that were icy. The troops stood up splendidly under the marching test and under the vigorous conditions of housing which were necessary on the march they had learned to take the weather of france in the same easy inconsequential way they took the language for a second time the german spy system fell a good deal short of its reputed omniscience seemingly the enemy was not forewarned of the coming of the americans despite the fact that the troops were tired from their long march the relief was carried out without a hitch tua had been regarded as a comparatively quiet sector and while it never did blaze up into major actions during the early months of nineteen eighteen it was hardly a rest camp it was as the phrase goes locally active few parts of the front were enlivened with as many raids and minor thrusts and no man's land was the scene of constant patrol encounters which lost nothing in spirit even if they bulked small in size and importance it is probable that the germans had no ambitious offensive plans in regard to the toa sector they tried however to keep the americans at that point so busy and so harassed that it would be impossible for pershing to send men to help stem the drives against the french and the english the failure of this plan will be shown in the later chapters before going on to take up in some detail the life of the men in the toa sector it is necessary to record a casualty suffered by major general leonard wood while inspecting the french lines general wood was wounded in the arm when a french gun exploded five french soldiers were killed and lieutenant colonel charles e kilbourne and major kenyon a joyce who accompanied general wood were slightly wounded wood returned to america shortly after the accident and did not have the privilege of coming back to france with the division he had trained but for all that he had a unique distinction leonard wood was the first american major-general to earn the right to a wounded stripe the german artillery was active along the toa front and the percentage of losses while small was higher than it had been in the Lunaville trenches of course the american artillery was not inactive it had a deal of practice during the early days of february the Germans attempted to ambush a patrol on the 19th and failed, and on the next night a sizable raid broke down under a barrage which was promptly furnished by the American batteries in response to signals from the trench, which the Germans were attempting to isolate. The first job for America did not come on the Toa sector, but near the Chemin de Dante. American artillery had already shown proficiency in this sector by laying down a barrage for the French, who took a small height near Tailleur. Hilaire Belloc referred to this action as small in extent, but of high historical importance. The importance consisted in the fact that for the first time American artillerymen had an opportunity of rolling a barrage ahead of an attacking force. They showed their ability to solve the rather difficult timing problems involved certain historical importance then must be given to the action of february twenty third when an american raiding party in conjunction with the french penetrated a few hundred yards into the german lines and captured two german officers twenty men and a machine gun this little action should not be forgotten because it was practically the first success of the americans 
it gave some indication of the efficient help which persing's men were to give later on in falk's great counter-attack which drove the germans across the marne it is interesting to know that every man in the american battalion stationed on the chemin de dames volunteered for the raid of this number only twenty-six were picked there were approximately three times as many french in the party and it must be remembered that the affair was strictly a french show the raid was carefully planned and rehearsals were held back of the line over country similar to that which the americans would cross in the raid at five thirty in the morning the barrage began and it continued for an hour with guns of many calibers having their say the attack was timed almost identically with the relief to the german trenches and the boches were caught unawares the fact that a shell made a direct hit on a big dugout did not tend to improve german morale the little party of americans had already cut two thousand nine hundred ninety nine miles and some yards from the distance which separated their country from the war and they were anxious to cover the remaining distance their french companions set them the example of not running into their own barrage qualis and doughboys jumped into the enemy trench together there was a little sharp hand-to-hand -hand fighting but not a great deal as the german officers ordered their men to give ground the group of prisoners were captured almost in a body further researches along communicating trenches and into dugouts failed to yield any more attackers and prisoners started back for their own lines on schedule time the german artillery tried to cut them off one shell wounded five of the germans and six frenchmen but the american contingent was fortunate enough to escape without a single casualty the french expressed themselves as well pleased with the conduct of their pupils they said that the americans had approached the barrage too closely once or twice but this was not remarkable as it was the first time american infantry had advanced behind a screen of shell-fire their inexperience also excused their tendency to go a little too far after the german trench line had been reached on february twenty sixth the americans on the toyou front had their first experience with a serious gas attack of course gas shells had been thrown at them before but this was the first time they had been subjected to a steady bombardment some of the men were not sufficiently cautious a few were slow in getting their masks on and others took theirs off too soon the result was that five men were killed and fifty or sixty injured by the gas two days later the americans on the chemin des dames were heavily attacked but the germans were driven off march found the Toulouse sector receiving more attention than usual from the germans the germans made a strong thrust on the morning of march first the raid was a failure as three german prisoners remained in american hands and many germans were killed gas did not prove as effective as on the last occasion the doughboys were quick to put on their masks and as soon as the bombardment ended they waited for the attacking party and swept them with machine guns about two hundred and forty germans participated in the attack some succeeded in entering the american first line trench but they were expelled after a little sharp fighting an american captain who tried to cut off the german retreat by waylaying the raiders as they started back for their own lines was killed on the same day a raid against the chemin des dons position failed the germans left four prisoners two days after the attempted toe raid premier clemenceau visited the american sector and awarded the croix de guerre with palm to two lieutenants two sergeants and two privates the premier who knows american inhibitions just as well as he knows the language departed a little from established customs in awarding the medals nobody was kissed instead clemenceau patted the doughboys on the shoulder and said that's the way to do it one soldier was late in arriving and he seemed to be much afraid that this might cost him his cross but the premier handed it to him with a smile you were on time the other morning he said that's enough in an official note clemenceau described the action of the americans as follows it was a very fine success reflecting great honor on the tenacity of the american infantry and the accuracy of the artillery fire the americans made a number of raids during march but the germans were holding their front lines loosely and usually abandoned them when attacked which made it difficult to get prisoners an incident which stands out occurred on march seventh when a lone sentry succeeded in repulsing a german patrol practically unaided he was fortunate enough to kill the only officer with his first shot this took the heart out of the germans 
the lone american was shooting so fast that they did not realize he was a solitary defender and they fled on march fourteenth american troops made their first territorial gain but it can hardly be classed as an offensive some enemy trenches northeast of baronville in the luneville sector were abandoned by the germans because they had been pretty thoroughly smashed up by american artillery fire these trenches were consolidated with the american position april saw the first full-scale engagement in which american troops took part at seychepre but earlier in the month there was some spirited fighting by americans poilies and doughboys repelled an attack in the Empremont forest on april twelfth the american elements of the defending force took twenty-two prisoners the german attack was renewed the next day but the franco-american forces dislodged the germans by a vigorous counter-attack after they had gained a foothold in the first line trenches the biggest attack yet attempted on the Toul front occurred on april fourteenth picked troops from four german companies numbering some four hundred men were sent forward to attack after an unusually heavy bombardment the germans were known to have had sixty-four men killed and eleven were taken prisoner numerous stories more or less authentic were circulated after this engagement one which is well vouched for concerns a young italian who met eight germans in a communicating trench and killed one and captured three the remaining four found safety in flight the youngster turned his prisoners over to a sergeant and asked for a match i'll give you a match if you bring me another german said the non-commissioned officer the little italian was a literal man and he wanted the match very much he went back over the parapet and in five minutes he returned escorting quite a large german who was crying camarade while american soldiers on the front were gaining experience which stood them in good stead at seychepre and later at cantigny great progress was made in the organization of the american forces late in the spring the first field army was formed this army was composed of two army corps each made up of one regular army division one national army division and one division of national guard major general hunter liggett became the first field army commander of the overseas forces and it was his men who covered themselves with so much distinction and the great counter blows of july end of chapter seventeen recording by gary b clayton chapter eighteen of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b our army at the front by haywood brune chapter eighteen a civilian visitor destiny always plays the flying wedge there is always this significant little happening half noticed or miscalculated which trails great happenings after it on march nineteenth nineteen eighteen a derby hat appeared in the front line trenches held by the american army in france this promptly was accorded the honor by the army and the allied representatives of being the first derby hat that had ever been seen in a trench the hat had the honor to be on the head of the first american secretary of war who had ever been in europe in his term of office and this first american secretary of war away from home was presently to have the honor of helping to create the first generalissimo who had ever commanded an army of twenty-six allies all of which is to say that newton d baker on a tour of inspection of the a e f whose visit was to have such terrific fruition repudiated the war councils which would have kept him out of the trenches on this gusty march day and went down to see for himself and all the americans at home how the doughboy was faring and what could be done for him and as he peered over the parapet into no man's land secretary baker said i am standing on the frontier of freedom the phrase grew its wings in the saying and by nightfall it had found the farthest doughboy the paris newspapers announced on the morning of march twelfth that secretary baker was in france the troops had it by noon and questions flew in swarms it was discovered that he would review the brigade of veterans 
who had returned from service at the front on march twentieth and that meanwhile he would investigate the lines of communication after a few days in paris during which secretary baker delivered all the persuasions he had brought from president wilson on behalf of a unified command of the allied armies and had it was rumored turned the scale in favor of a generalissimo the distinguished civilian went to the coast to see the port city which was the pride of the army and the marvel of france the secretary rode to the coast on a french train but once there he was transferred to an american train which had to make up in sentimental importance the large lack it had of elegance a flat car was rapidly rigged up with plank benches this had the merit of affording plenty of view and after all that was what the secretary had come for after rolling over the main arteries of the two hundred miles of terminal trackage secretary baker inspected the warehouses assembling plants camps etc and walked three mortal miles of dock front which his countrymen had evolved from an oozing marsh he paid his highest compliments to the engineers and the laborers and amazed the officers by the acuteness of his questions if his visit did nothing else it convinced the men on the job that the man back home knew what the obstacles were secretary baker's next visit was to the biggest of the aviation fields where again his technical understanding as it came out in his questions astounded and cheered the men who were doing the building secretary baker carried his office with him a delightful discovery to the men in the aviation fields who had some problems sorely pressing for decision and who found when they told them to mr baker that he had no aversion to taking action on the spot for example at aviation headquarters mr baker asked if the flyers who came first from america were the first to have their commissions after the final flights in france he learned that because of some delay in giving final instruction through no fault of the aviators these first commissions had not been given mr baker instituted a full inquiry at once and at the end of it directed that the commissions when finally awarded should bear a date one day in advance of all others so that the priority rightfully earned should not be lost after hours in the field during which hundreds of machines with american pilots flew in squadron formation and many experts did spectacular single flights mr baker made a short speech to the flyers a french officer who had been instructing at the field said to mr baker with all these machines in the air you see no more than a tenth of what america has in this one school you will soon have no more need of french instruction we have shown everything we know and your young men have taken to the art with astonishing facility as well as audacity nerve and resource the danger and difficulties fascinate and inspire them i think it must be what you call the sporting spirit as he was leaving the aviation field secretary baker said the spirit of every man in this camp seems in keeping with the mission which brought him to france the camps appointments and organization are admirable it is gratifying to learn from their french instructors that our young aviators are proving themselves daring cool and skillful on the night of march eighteenth secretary baker began his preparations for a visit to the trenches with a general commanding a division and one other officer he motored to the farthest point where he dined and stayed the night in a french chateau at dawn the next morning the party made ready to go on but the boches appeared to have a hunch they shelled the road on which secretary baker had planned to travel with such ferocity that the officers in command refused to take the risk of permitting mr baker to go over it the american general and all the french officers then begged mr baker to give up the trip to the trenches they wasted a lot of persuasion mr baker just went by another road a colonel of about mr baker's build had loaned him a trench overcoat and some rubber boots and the secretary had a tin helmet and a gas mask but he would wear the tin helmet only for a moment and the mask not at all the officers in charge of the party found presently to their acute horror that even the trenches were not enough for mr baker 
nothing would do him but a listening post and when he had finally got back safe and had come back to the communication trenches from the front everyone breathed a sigh of relief the relief was premature for the liveliest danger of all was on the return motor trip when an immense shell buried itself in a crater not fifty yards from the secretary fortunately the debris flew all in the opposite direction and nobody was hurt the first division heard an address the following day from secretary baker it would seem more fit he said and i should much prefer it if instead of addressing you i should listen to your experiences your division has the distinction of being the first to arrive in france may every man in your ranks aim to make the first division the first in accomplishment with you came a body of the marines those well-disciplined ship-shape soldiers of the navy yours was the first experience in being billeted and in all the initial details of adjusting yourselves to new and strange conditions in this as in developing a system of training you were the pioneers blazing the way while succeeding contingents could profit by your mistakes day after day and week after week you had to continue the hard drudgery of instruction which is necessary to proficiency in modern war you had to restrain your impatience to go into the trenches under general pershing's wise demand for that thoroughness the value of which you now appreciate as result of actual service in the trenches if sometimes the discipline seemed wearing you now know you would have paid for its absence with your lives if i had any advice to give it is to strike hard and shoot straight and i would warn you at the same time against any carelessness any surrendering to curiosity which would make you a mark needlessly the better you are trained the more valuable is your life to your country as a fighter who seeks to make the soldier of the enemy rather than yourself pay the supreme price of war on every hand i am told that you are prepared to fight to the end and i see this spirit in your faces depend upon us at home to stand by you in a spirit worthy of you next secretary baker spoke though informally to the forty second division far better known as the rainbow division there he explained some of the reasons for military secrecy while it was in training at home i saw a good deal of the rainbow division he said then one day it was gone to france where it disappeared behind the curtain of military secrecy which must be drawn unless we choose to sacrifice the lives of our men for the sake of publicity the enemy's elaborate intelligence system seeks at any cost to learn the strength the preparedness and the character of our troops our own intelligence service assures us that the knowledge of our army in france which some assume to exist does not in fact exist if we were to announce the identity of each unit that comes to france then we would fully inform the enemy of the number and nature of our forces published details about any division are most useful to expert military intelligence officers in determining the state of the division's preparedness and the probable assignment of the division to any section but now it is safe to mention certain divisions which were first to arrive in france and have already been in the line this includes the rainbow division famous because it is representative of all parts of the united states this division should find in its character an inspiration to esprit de corps and general excellence it should be conscious of its mission as a symbol of national unity the men of ohio i know as ohioans and i am proud that they have been worthy of ohio a citizen of another state will find himself equally at home in some other group and the gauge of this state's pride will be the discipline of that group of soldiers its conduct as men its courage and its skill in the trenches you may learn more than war in france you may learn lessons from france whose unity and courage have been a bulwark against that sinister force whose character you are learning in the trenches the frenchman is first of all a frenchman which stimulates rather than weakens his pride in brittany as a breton in lorraine as a lorrainer and his loyalty and affection for his own town or village or home in truth he fights for his family and his home 
when he fights for france and civilization thus you will fight best and serve best by being first an american with no diminution of your loyalty to your state and your community with us at home the development of a new national unity seems a vague process compared to the concrete process you are undergoing you are uniting north east south and west in action we aim to support you with all our resources to make sure that you do not fight in vain the brigade of the veterans was reviewed on the last day of the camp inspection secretary baker went by motor with officers and aides as far as the foot of the hill from which he was to review the troops deploying in the marne valley twenty days of rain had made the hilltop inaccessible by motor as secretary baker started up one slope general pershing and his aides ascended another and the two men met at the top the brigade swept by a company front with full marching equipment they were the first brigade to be reviewed after it had been in action and they held to their flawless formation chins up and chests out in spite of clogging mud that was almost too much for the mules the review ended in compliments all around secretary baker's enthusiasm was conveyed even to the lesser officers general pershing said these men have been there and know what it is you can tell that by the way they throw out their chests as they swing by america at last had her veterans they were to dignify the coming gift of them to heroic size End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by betty b our army at the front by haywood brune chapter nineteen a famous gesture when america had put the power of all her eloquence into the growing demand among the allies for a unified command and when as a result of this pressure general foch chief of staff of the french army and hero of the battle of the marne had been made generalissimo general pershing put into words in what the french called a superb gesture the final sacrifice his country was prepared to make the first of the great german drives of nineteen eighteen had halted but the battle was nowhere near its end general foch was sparing every possible energy on the battle front and heaping up every atom of force for his reserve and on the morning of march twenty eighth general pershing went to headquarters and offered the american army in full to general foch to put where he pleased without any regard whatever for america's earlier wish to fight with her army intact it was the final sacrifice to the idealistic point of view it had indisputably the heroic quality and as such it was rewarded in the countries of the allies with appreciation beyond measure i have come said general pershing to general foch that morning to say to you that the american people would hold it a great honor for our troops if they were engaged in the present battle i ask it of you in my name and in that of the american people there is at this moment no other question than that of fighting infantry artillery aviation all that we have are yours to dispose of them as you will others are coming which are as numerous as will be necessary i have come to say to you that the american people would be proud to be engaged in the greatest battle in history this offer was placed immediately by general foch before the french war council at the front a council including premier clemenceau commander-in-chief pétain and louis le Chour, minister of munitions and was immediately accepted american army orders went forth in french from that day and on those orders the army was presently scattered through the vast reserve army from flanders with the british to verdun with the italians and the french they were not to go into actual battle except near their own sectors till the third monster drive in july for general foch makes a religion of the reserve army and fabian tactics but they spread through the battle line from switzerland to the sea as general pershing had suggested and all we have was at work 
paris acclaimed the move royally la liberté wrote general pershing yesterday took in the name of his country action which was grand in its simplicity and of moving beauty in a few words without adornment but in which vibrated an accent of chivalrous passion general pershing made to france the offer of an entire people take all he said all is yours the honor pershing claims is shared by us and it is with a sentiment of real pride that our soldiers will greet into their ranks those of the new world who come to them as brothers secretary baker from american general headquarters gave out a statement i am delighted at general pershing's prompt and effective action he said in placing all the american troops and facilities at the disposal of the allies in the present situation it will be met with hearty approval in the united states where the people desire their expeditionary force to be of the utmost service in the common cause i have visited all the american troops in france some of them recently and had an opportunity to observe the enthusiasm with which officers and men received the announcement that they would be used in the present conflict one regiment to which the announcement was made spontaneously broke into cheers the british government issued an official statement on the night of april first as a result of communications which have passed between the prime minister and president wilson of deliberations between secretary baker who visited london a few days ago and the prime minister mr balfour and lord darby and consultations in france in which general pershing and general bliss participated important decisions have been come to by which large forces of trained men in the american army can be brought to the assistance of the allies in the present struggle the government of our great western ally is not only sending large numbers of american battalions to europe during the coming critical months but has agreed to such of its regiments as cannot be used in divisions of their own being brigaded with french and british units so long as the necessity lasts by this means troops which are not sufficiently trained to fight as divisions and army corps will form part of seasoned divisions until such time as they have completed their training and general pershing wishes to withdraw them in order to build up the american army throughout these discussions president wilson has shown the greatest anxiety to do everything possible to assist the allies and has left nothing undone which could contribute thereto this decision however of vital importance it will be to the maintenance of the allied strength in the next few months will in no way diminish the need for those further measures for raising fresh troops at home to which reference has already been made it is announced at once because the prime minister feels that the singleness of purpose with which the united states have made this immediate and indeed indispensable contribution toward the triumph of the allied cause should be clearly recognized by the british people lord redding the british ambassador at washington conveyed to president wilson a message of thanks from the british government for the instant and comprehensive measures which the president took in response to the request that american troops be used to reinforce the allied armies in france the embassy then gave out a statement that the knowledge that owing to the president's prompt cooperation the allies will receive the strong reinforcement necessary during the next few months is most welcome to the british government and people the london papers reflected this sentiment in even stronger terms said the westminster gazette it seals the unity of the allied forces in france and so far from weakening the determination to provide all possible reinforcements from this country it will we are confident give it fresh energy all the big loans america has made to great britain and france her heavy contributions of food her princely gifts through the red cross and the high stimulating utterances of president wilson have done much to strengthen the allied morale and lend material assistance to the war against autocracy but none of these count so heavily with the masses because there are few families here or in france who have not a personal and intimate interest in the soldiers battling on the plains of picardy the evening star wrote in a true spirit of soldierly comradeship they will march to the sound of guns 
and will merge their national pride in a common stock of courage for the common good it is a chivalrous decision and president wilson mr baker and general bliss have done a very great thing in a very great way the british and french people are moved by the splendid proof of america's fellowship in the fight for world freedom if this gift was so significant in spirit it was also bravely helpful in round numbers at the end of march nineteen eighteen general pershing had three hundred sixty six thousand one hundred forty two soldiers in his command in france and of these after nine months of training and adjustment he could put about one hundred thousand in the line and within three months after this time he had more than one million soldiers in france the navy department having accomplished the astounding feat of transporting six hundred thirty seven thousand nine hundred twenty nine in april may and june the month that the reinforcement of the french and british armies was planned and accepted the transport figures jumped from forty eight thousand odd to eighty three thousand odd the month of its first practical operation the figures jumped again to one hundred and seventeen thousand odd and in the month of june the month of the anniversary of the first debarkation there was a transportation of two hundred seventy six thousand three hundred seventy two men the last few days of march nineteen eighteen saw the first large troop movements from the american zone that is saw them strictly in the mind's eye actually the rain came down in such drenching downpours that the french villagers whom the motor trucks passed did not so much see as hear the doughboys throughout the whole zone the activity was prodigious along the muddy roads two great processions of motor trucks crossed each other day and night the one taking the soldiers to one front the other to another sometimes the camions slithered in the mud till they came to a stop in the gutter then the boisterous jubilant soldiers would tumble out and set their shoulders under wheels and mud guards and hoist the car into the road again the singing was incessant the mood of the song swung from the battle hymn of the republic to there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight the exuberance of the soldiers knew no bounds they were about to answer present to the roll call of the big guns the call they had been hearing for so many months that it seemed to them so persistently and personally compelling they were going to become a part of that living wall which for three years and a half had held the enemy out of paris those who were going to the british front were particularly exultant because they expected to find open fighting there the kind they called our specialty to all the units going into the french and british armies a general order was read jacking up discipline to the topmost notch the character of the service this command is now about to undertake read the order demands the enforcement of stricter discipline and the maintenance of higher standards of efficiency than any heretofore required in future the troops of this command will be held at all times to the strictest observance of that rigid discipline in camp and on the march which is essential to their maximum efficiency on the day of battle the first of the fighting troops arrived on the british front on the morning of april tenth after an all-night march they were grimed and mud-spattered hungry and tired and cold but the cheering that rose from the tommies when they recognized the american uniforms at the head of the column would have revived more exhausted men than they the first comers were infantry a battalion of them others came up during the day with artillery men and machine gunners the celebration of their coming lasted far into the next night and the commanders of the british front exchanged telegrams of congratulation with the commanders of the french front that they were to be so welcomely refreshed but generalissimo foch with his staunch determination not to be done out of his reserve held the americans back and they were destined to remain behind the main battle line for three and a half months longer meanwhile the american strength was piling steadily up in the reserve and in mid-may a large contingent of the national army said to be the first of them to land in europe reached the flanders front and began to train at once behind the british lines without preliminary work in american camps in france these men had what was probably the most exhilarating welcome of the war the tommies 
many of them wounded and sick poured out into the roadways as the new american army arrived and threw their caps into the air and split their throats with cheers the british had been terrifically hard pressed in the german offensive they had given ground only after incredible fighting they were in the phrase of general haig at last with their backs to the wall they held their line magnificently but they could not have been less than filled with thanksgiving that they were now to have the help of the least war-worn of all their allies End of chapter 19chapter twenty of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org our army at the front by haywood brown chapter twenty the first two battles while generalissimo foch was strengthening his long line with american troops as flying buttresses those sectors delegated to the americans in their own right saw two battles within a few weeks of each other which attained to the dignity of names the battle of sichepre the first big american defensive action and the battle of cantigny the first big offensive the one in the toll sector the other in picardy were the occasions of the american baptism of fire the one was so valiant the other so brilliant and both were so reassuring to the high commands of the allies that they would deserve a special emphasis even if they had not the distinction of being america's first battles on the night of april twenty twenty one the german bombardment of sichepre a village east of the renner's wood and just northwest of toll grew to monstrous proportions frenchmen who had seen the great verdun offensive in which the german crown prince had made a new record for artillery preparation said that the heavy firing on the american sector eclipsed any of the action at verdun the firing covered a front of a mile and a quarter the bombardment was of high explosive shells and gas apparently an effort to disable the return fire from american artillery but all through the night the artillerymen sent their shells encasing themselves in gas masks toward dawn the attack began a full regiment of german soldiers preceded by twelve hundred shock troops advanced under a barrage halfway across no man's land the american artillery laid down a counter barrage and many of the germans dropped under it but still the great waves of them came on focusing on the village of sichepre the impact of their terrific numbers was too powerful to be withstood at once the american troops fell back from some of their first-line trenches which the first bombardment had caused them to hold loosely and part of the forces fell back even from the village the germans marched into the village evidently believing it to have been totally abandoned carrying their flame-throwers and grenades but making no use of them suddenly they discovered that certain american troops had been left to defend the village while the main force reformed at the rear and hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the streets became necessary an american commander sent word back that the troops were giving ground by inches and that they could hold on for a few hours sichepre the first big american battle had every element of the world war in little before the loss of the village which occurred about noon the troops defending it had fought from ambush and in the open had fought with gas and liquid fire with grenades rifles and machine guns in the inferno the new troops were giving proof of valor that was to come out later and be scattered broadcast as a measure of what america would bring in and out of the streets of sichepre in its little public square from the yards of its houses hundreds of american soldiers were fighting for their lives france lay behind them trusting to be saved 
other americans were behind them racing into formation with french troops for the counter-attack the defenders of sichepre giving by inches had a battle cry of their own brief and racy of the football fields hold em after a while the germans took sichepre the hideously pressed slow giving outpost moved back before the day had finished the shell-stripped streets of sichepre sheltering the invaders weltered again under the first american shells of the counter-attack by nightfall the troops were creeping forward under the counter barrage the army reformed refreshed and replenished was on its way to take its own back again the counter battle lacked the monstrous grueling of the first attack it took less time the superiority of numbers had shifted to the other side and the white heat of determination did its share the germans held sichepre about four hours the main positions of the army which were threatened were untouched because of the stoutness of the resistance at the village and most of the first line positions were retaken with the rush of the counter-attack the german prisoners who were captured had many days rations in their kits and extra loads of trench tools on their backs they had intended to hold the american trenches for several days facing them the other way before they commenced the new attack which in the plan of the german high command was to break apart the french and american lines where they joined above toll once this wedge was into the allied vitals the rest was to be easy though sichepre did not count as a big battle in point of numbers engaged or numbers lost it loomed large enough in the importance it had strategically the german high command obviously expected little or nothing from the green american troops the shock troops had been rehearsed for weeks to take the american lines and hold them till the allied line should be broken apart in fact it was nobly planned the only compliment the americans could squeeze out of it was that the germans were sent over in many places eight to their one but the capture of sichepre lasted just four hours and the disruption of the franco-american line remained a mere brainchild of the wilhelmstrasse the french soldiers who joined the counter-attack told thrilling stories of the americans they told that in one place north of sichepre an american detachment was separated into small groups and was cut off from the company to which it belonged through the entire fight behind the americans and on their left flank were german units but they could have retired on the right they decided to stay and fight so there they stayed notwithstanding incessant enemy bombardment in the town of sichepre a squad of americans found a few cases of hand grenades with these they put up a tremendous fight through the whole day holding to a strip at the northern end of the village they refused to surrender when they were ordered to and at the end of the fighting only nine of the original twenty-three were left by the grace of these nine men sichepre was never wholly german even for the four hours one new england boy passed through the enemy barrage seven times to carry ammunition to his comrades a courier who was twice blown off the road by shell explosions carried his message through and dropped as he reported a lieutenant with only six men patrolled six hundred yards of the front throughout the day holding communications open between the battalions to the right and left of him a sanitary squad runner captured by the germans escaped them and made his way into sichepre tending the wounded there till help came a machine gunner found himself alone with his gun and on being asked by a superior officer if he could hold the line there replied that he could do it if he were not killed he did a regimental chaplain went to the assistance of a battery which was hard pressed and carried ammunition for them for hours and then took his turn at the gun these made no roster of the heroes of sichepre there were hundreds of them but the censor's passionate aversion to details of all battles has scotched the narrative of heroes for the present 
Cantigny will warm the cockles of the American heart as long as it beats. There was a battle that for spirit, flair, brilliancy, came up to the rosiest dream that ever was dreamed in Washington or London or Paris. Cantigny, like Sichepre, was not an engagement of great numbers. It was a little town that was hard to capture. It commanded a fine view of the American lines for miles back, and it had been able to withstand some violent attempts earlier, so it was particularly desirable. And it was in a salient, so that it formed an angle in the line. Its taking straightened the line, heartily disgruntled the Boches, who lost two hundred prisoners and many hundred wounded and dead in defending it and it gave the american troops their first taste of the offensive but more than that it gave these same troops a record of absolutely flawless workmanship which if not large was at least complete the capture of tantigny and two hundred yards beyond it which included the german second line took just three quarters of an hour in the niggardly terms of the communique this morning in picardy our troops attacked on a front of one and a fourth miles, advanced our lines, and captured the village of Cantigny. We took two hundred prisoners and inflicted on the enemy severe losses in killed and wounded. Our casualties were relatively small. Hostile counterattacks broke down under our fire. It was on the morning of May 28th. At a quarter to six, a bombardment began. At a quarter to seven, the troops went over the top. The barrage went first, a dense gray veil, and then came twelve French tanks. Just behind the tanks stalked the doughboys. The soldiers moved like clockwork. There were no unruly fringes to be nipped by the barrage. There was no break in the methodical stride. They went forward first a hundred yards in two minutes, then the barrage slowed to a hundred yards in four minutes. In a little while the troops had arrived at the edge of the village, and then the close-quarter fighting began. At 7.30 a white rocket rose from the center of Cantigny, dim against the smoky sky, to tell the men behind that the objective is reached and prisoners are coming. The Americans found the enemy in confusion and unreadiness, and the initial resistance from machine guns at the town's edge was easily overcome where the burden of hard fighting came was in routing the germans out from the caves and tunnels and cellars of the town into which they had retired there was a long tunnel in the town which after furious fighting was surrounded and isolated the flamethrowers were placed at both ends of the tunnel and that episode was ended some of the caves were large enough to hold a battalion. These were handled by the mopping-up troops, who threw hand grenades. The prisoners began to file back almost immediately. One grinning Pittsburgher, wounded in the arm, marched in the rear of a prison squad. "'That's handing it to them, Huns, blankety blank em, he said cheerfully. The village caught fire from the bombardment and the firing of the tunnel and for hours after its capture the soldiers had to fight flames the first of the american shock troops went from the village on to the german second line trenches and under a hail of bullets from german machine guns dug themselves in and faced the trenches the other way all that day they held their prize unmolested they had all the high ground beyond cantigny and an approach was to put it mildly precarious but by five of the afternoon the german counter-attacks had begun one wave after another stormed halfway up the hill then tumbled down again broken under the american artillery four counter-attacks were made against cantigny but all of them failed the new positions were consolidated under heavy fire and gas attack and there they stayed this gallant battle called forth intemperate commendation from the headquarters of the allies the french dispatch to washington told officially of the high opinion the french held of it and there were many congratulatory telegrams from london 
the press of london and paris glowed with praises the london evening news wrote bravo the young americans nothing in today's battle narrative from the front is more exhilarating than the account of their fight at cantigny it was a clean cut from beginning to end like one of their countrymen's short stories and the short story of cantigny is going to expand into a full-length novel which will write the doom of the kaiser and kaiserism we expected it we have seen those young americans in london and merely to glance at them was to know that they are conquerors and brothers in that great anglo-saxon latin compact which will bring down the prussian idol they do not swagger and they have no war illusions they have done their first job with swift precision characteristic of the united states and cantigny will one day be repeated a thousandfold the times wrote our allies know the significance of that as well as we do so too do the german generals and the german statesmen it means that the last great factor between autocracy and freedom is coming into effective play on the battlefield there could be no reflection more heartening for the allies or more dismaying to their adversaries their adversaries meanwhile were doing what they could to keep their dismay to themselves in the german announcement of the loss of cantigny there was mention only of the enemy the german people were not to know for a while that the ridiculous little american army had got to work End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. our army at the front by hayward brown chapter twenty one teufel hunden no branch of the service in the american army was so quick to achieve group consciousness as the marines to be sure these soldiers of the sea had a considerable tradition behind them before they came to france the world is never so peaceful that there is nothing for the marines to do always there is some spot for them to land and put a situation into hand it is no fault of the marines that most of these brushes have been little affairs and they have found as mr kipling says that the things you learn from the yellow and brown will help you a heap with the white the navy department has always been careful to preserve the position of the marines the organization has never lacked for intelligent publicity first to fight was a slogan which brought many a recruit into the corps even the dreary work of policing which falls largely to the marines has been dramatized to a certain extent by that fine swaggering couplet of their song if the army or the navy ever gaze on heaven's scenes they will find the streets are guarded by united states marines the belief that the marines would make a distinctive mark in the great world war was practically unanimous army officers couldn't deny it war correspondents hastened to proclaim it and the germans admitted it by bestowing the name teufelhunden devil dogs on the marines immediately after their first engagement the marines themselves were second to no one in the consciousness of their own prowess i understand said a little marine just two days off the transport that this kaiser isn't afraid of the american army so much but that he's afraid of the marines the boy didn't say whether one of his officers had told him that but his belief was passionate and complete however the marines did not allow their high confidence to interfere in any way with their preparations they showed the same anxiety to make good on the training fields that they later displayed on the line their camp in the american area was just a bit further from the centre of things than that of any other organization whenever there was a review or a special show of any sort for a distinguished visitor the marines had to march twelve miles to attend and after that it was twelve miles home again but they thrived on hard work they shot bayoneted and bombed just a little better than any other organization in the first division sometimes individual marines would complain a little about the fact that they were worked harder than any men in the division 
but they always took care to add that they had finished the construction of their practice trench system days before any of the others and they mentioned the fact that they had achieved this result by working in day and night shifts it was never possible to tell whether they were airing a grievance or making a boast it is probable there was something of the mind of job whose boils were both a tribulation and a triumph there was no doubt as to the opinion of the marines when it seemed for a time as if they might not get into the fighting they did not go into the trenches with the first division but were broken up and sent to various points for police duty of course they were bitterly disappointed but they merely policed a little harder and it was a severe winter for soldiers who went about with their overcoats unbuttoned or committed other breaches of military regulation since the marines did hard work well they were rewarded by more hard work and this was labour more to their taste the reward came suddenly on may the thirtieth a unit of the marines was in a training camp so far back of the lines that it was impossible to hear the sound of the guns even when the germans turned everything loose for a big offensive on that same day the germans reached the marne east of chateau thierry and began an advance along the north bank towards the city that night the marines were ordered to the front they rode almost a hundred kilometres to get into the fight it was late afternoon when they reached a hill overlooking chateau thierry french guns all about them were being fired up to their very limit or a little beyond the germans were coming on these marines had never been in battle before with the exception of a few who had chased little brown rebels in various brief encounters on small islands they had never been under shell fire and this their first engagement was one of the biggest in the greatest war in history from the hill they could see houses fold up and the fields pucker under the pounding of big guns the marines were told that as soon as darkness came they would march into the town and hold the bridges against the german army which was coming on somebody asked a french officer some days later how these green troops had taken their experience as they waited the word to go forward they were concombres said the frenchman our word is cucumbers finally the order came for the advance it was a dark night but the marines could see their way forward well enough the german bombardment had set fire to the railroad station the americans kept in the shadows as much as they could but they danced around so much that it was difficult they placed their machine guns here and there behind walls and new barricades so they could enfilade the approaches to the bridges and the streets on the opposite side of the river one lieutenant with twelve men and two guns took up a position across the river it was up to him to stand off the first rush the shelling from the enemy guns was intensified during the night but the infantry had not yet reached the town it was five o'clock of a bright morning when the little advance post of the americans saw the germans coming across the open field toward the river they were marching along carelessly in two columns and there were twelve men in every line one of the machine guns swung her nose round a little and the fight was on at last the american was definitely in one of the major engagements of the war american machine gunners were doing their bit to block the advance on paris all day long the marines held the germans back with their machine guns and that night they beat back a german mass attack when the boches came on and on in waves with men locked arm in arm they could hear them for well, they sang as they rushed forward and the machine gunners pumped their bullets into the spots where the notes were loudest the next day the americans were forced to give some ground when the order came to retire but they had been through perhaps the most intensive two days of training which ever fell to the lot of green troops the marines did not have to wait long for retaliation other units of marines from other camps had been hurrying up to the front and on june the sixth an offensive was launched on a front of two and a half miles the first day's gain was two and three sixteenth miles and a hundred prisoners were captured this attack yielded all the important high ground northwest of chateau thierry the marines did not rest with this gain they struck again at five o'clock in the afternoon and by june the seventh the attack had grown to much greater proportions four villages vinley voili la potere torcy bourreches fell into the hands of the french and americans 
the thrust was pressed to a maximum depth of two miles on a ten-mile front more than three hundred prisoners were captured by the americans the attack was carried out under american command major general james g harboard being in charge of the operation as in the contigny offensive the americans worked with great speed and showed that they could make the rifle an effective weapon even under the changed conditions of modern warfare but though they were swift they were not silent they went over the top shouting like indians and they kept up the noise as they went forward the second attack was carried out by the same men who had advanced in the morning the early showing had been so promising that it was decided to go on particularly as the germans seemed to be somewhat shaken by the violence of the assault in this new sweep the marines took ground on either side of Belleau wood they also captured the ravine south of torcy the germans were not able to organize an effective counter-attack immediately for they had been too much surprised by the thrust also the effective work of the american artillery made it difficult for the germans to bring up fresh troops in the rough country over which the battle was fought there was an opportunity for the fight to disintegrate into the little eddies where individual initiative counts for so much in a fight nearly thoroughly captain james o'green jr found himself cut off by the germans he was accompanied by five privates back at regimental headquarters green had already been reported as killed or captured he proved the need of clerical revision for he and his men fought their way back to the american lines at one point ten germans tried to intercept him but the six americans succeeded in killing or wounding every member of the enemy party a single marine who was taking back a prisoner ran into two german officers and ten men he fell upon them with a rifle and bayonet and disposed of both officers and several of the men then he made his escape somebody told the marine when he got back to the american lines that he had certainly been in luck hell no said the fighting man he took my prisoner away from me still another marine was captured while dazed by a blow on the head he recovered in time to deal his captor a tremendous punch on the jaw and made his way back to the american lines the favourite slogan of the Americans was, Each man get a German, don't let a German get you. Early on June the 8th, the Germans launched a counter-attack against the American position between Boiseches and Le Tiolet. This attack broke down. The trenches which the Americans held were new and shallow, but the troops were well supplied with machine guns, and the German infantry never got closer than within a couple of hundred yards of the position the marines were not yet content with their success they took the initiative again on june the tenth and smashed into the german lines for about two-thirds of a mile on a six hundred yard front in this attack two mine and Werfer were captured the object of the attack was to clean out Belleau wood the germans retained only the northern fringe by this time the offensive had ceased to be a wholly marine affair the ninth and twenty-third regiments of infantry comprising what is known as the syracuse brigade took up their positions on the right of the soldiers of the sea during the next few days the germans made several violent counter-attacks but without success and on june the twenty sixth the americans pushed their gains still further by a successful assault south of torcy in which more than two hundred and fifty germans were captured this victory gave pershing's men absolute command of the bosti below which was the strategic point for which the germans had fought so hard it was after the chateau thierry offensive that for the first time the american army won a place in the german official communique before that they had been simply the enemy and once upon the occasion of a successful german raid north american troops but now berlin unbent a little and used the term an american regiment germany was prepared to admit that america was in the war it is just possible that some of their men who broke before the rush of the marines returned to give headquarters the information end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of our army at the front this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org
Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Our Army at the Front by Hayward Brown. Chapter 22 The Army of Maneuver. While the American Army was showing its quality in the minor battles of Seychucre, Cantani, Chateau Thierry, and Vaux, and its quantity was showing itself in leaps of hundreds of thousands of men a month, a destiny was shaping for it, equally in circumstances and in the mind of Generalissimo Foch which was to be even greater than it had sacrificed in late march when it submerged its identity and said put us where you will for when on july eighteen the fifth german offensive suddenly shivered into momentary equilibrium and then rolled back with foch and the allies pounding behind it and when this counter-attack developed into a continuing offensive which was to straighten the marne salient and throw back the germans from before amiens and do this future only knows what else besides the allied world said in one voice foch has found his army of maneuver and it's the americans while the germans were trying two systems first the broad front attack which trusted to overbear by sheer weight anything which opposed it and second the so-called hutier system of draining the line of all its best fighters and organizing shock troops immeasurably above the average for offensive while the line was held by the ragtag and bobtail the french stuck to their traditional system this was to hold the lines with the lightest possible number of men of the highest possible caliber and to thrust with a mobile force footloose and ready to be swung wherever a spot seemed likely to give way it was with the army of maneuver thrown up from paris in frantic haste by guyani in taxicabs and trucks that general foch made the miraculous plunge through the saxon army at ferion tardenois in september nineteen fourteen which saved the first battle of the marne when general foch became generalissimo in late march just after the first german offensive on march twenty one had thrown the british back and when the french were retreating at montdidier the expectation universally was that the allies would begin an offensive within the shortest possible time foch had been quoted all over the world as saying that defensive fighting was no defense yet april may and june passed and part of july and except for scattering attacks along the marne salient and patient rearguard action when the retreats were necessary the allies made no move the austrian debacle came and went foch had italy off his mind and the italians were more than taking care of themselves still he did not strike and finally it became clear that he was showing this long patience because he wanted what every frenchman wants first in every battle and what he did not surely have until july his army of maneuver the fitness of the american army for this brilliant use was dual first that its source was virtually inexhaustible second that it was better at offensive than defensive fighting the american army had a quality and the defect of that quality it wanted to get to berlin regardless of tactics and while general foch was trusting to time to prove to them that pleasant or unpleasant the tactics had to be observed he turned their spectacular fire and exuberance to direct account of course the american troops in france then ready to fight could not alone make up the allied army of maneuver they were the core of it however and their growing numbers guaranteed it almost indefinitely so that the attack of which it was to be the backbone could safely be begun some of the troops originally intended for welding with the british and french armies were kept in the line without change but in the main the statement was true the american army was to rove behind the allied lines till foch discovered or divined a german weakness to strike into in the second battle of the marne begun that july eighteenth when the allies took the offensive again for the first time in more than a year the crown prince and his army of approximately half a million were tucked down in the marne salient driving for paris the german line came down from soissons to chateau thierry ran east from thierry along the marne river then turned up again to rem in the space of about thirty miles where the crown prince had imprudently poured all his troops which for the fifth offensive begun july fifteenth included about a third of the manpower of the western front the allied troops lying around the three sides of the salient were french and american on the western side americans across the bottom east from chateau thierry and french 
british and italian from the marne up to rheims while the french and british were squeezing in the two sides at the top it was the american job to keep the germans from bursting out from the bottom and if possible to break through or roll them back the americans began the attack east of chateau thierry where germans had crossed the marne and lay a few miles to the south of it there had been lesser actions here for several days in the process of stopping the enemy offensive and by the morning of the eighteenth the americans dominated the positions around the marne the first day of the counteroffensive had magnificent results the germans were forced back on a twenty-eight mile front for a depth varying from three to six miles and the americans captured four thousand prisoners and fifty guns twenty french towns were delivered and the germans began what appeared to be a precipitate retreat fauch's attack was mainly on the flank of the crown prince's army which had been left exposed in the rush toward Epernay and chalon far south of the marne the infantry attack was made with little or no artillery preparation the german general von bone was plainly caught napping the communiques on both sides were for once in agreement the french said after having broken the german offensive on the champagne and rim mountain fronts on the fifteenth sixteenth and seventeenth the french troops in conjunction with the american forces attacked the german positions on the eighteenth between the aisne and the marne on a front of forty-five kilometers about twenty-eight miles we have made an important advance into the enemy lines and have reached the plateau dominating soissons more than twenty villages have been retaken by the admirable dash of the franco-american troops south of the Orcht, our troops have gone beyond the general line of marisy st genevieve hautevain and below the german communique said between the aisne and the marne the french attacked with strong forces and tanks and captured some ground later in the same communique the conclusion was drawn the battle was decided in our favor on the second day while the march under soissons continued and there were scattering gains on the marne side the number of allied prisoners grew to seventeen thousand and the number of guns captured to three hundred and sixty nobody could tell at this point whether the crown prince's army was retreating voluntarily or involuntarily in many places the germans were taken by american soldiers from the peaceful pursuit of cutting wheat behind the lines some high officers were nabbed from their beds on the other hand the fact that the german rear-guard actions were chiefly with machine guns seemed to indicate that they were moving their heavy pieces back in fair orderliness on the third day the germans were back over the marne and the crown prince having sent an unavailing plea to prince ruprest for new troops suddenly showed fight with the crack prussian guards these guards had their worst failure of the war when they met the americans it is difficult to prevent the statement from sounding offensively boastful it is none the less true the germans having decided that their retreat was wearing the look of an utter rout and that they must resist fiercely enough to stop it risked a british breakthrough to the north by throwing in lutendorf's soldiers above the marne and although the american total of prisoners around soissons had risen to nearly six thousand and though they did force back the prussian guard they did not make prisoners from their number one american after another told afterward with a sort of reluctant admiration that the prussian guard had died where it stood this fighting near the Orkt and fatally near the vitals of the encircled crown prince was the most desperate of the second marne battles on july twenty one chateau thierry was given up by the germans and the pursuing allies french and american drove the enemy beyond the high road to soissons and threatened the only highway of retreat as well as the german stores the supply centre within the salient was ferion tardonnois and it was being raked by allied guns from both sides of the salient the character of the fighting changed again so that again it was impossible to make sure if von bone intended to stand somewhere north of the marne and put up a fight or if he intended to make all speed back to a straight line between soissons and rem the resistance was by machine gun so that americans having their first big experience with the enemy insistent that he had nothing but machine guns to trust to it is of course possible that the crown prince and von bone knew no more than anybody else whether they were going to clear out 
men and supplies or whether they would stop again and fight face foremost on july twenty two the german command answered the question at least partially on a line well above the marne they brought the big guns into play and poured in shock troops airplanes from the allied lines discovered however that the germans were burning towns and storehouses for many miles behind the line the pressure on the germans was being brought from the south where the americans were six or seven miles above chateau thierry and from west and north where the franco-american troops were flaying the exposed side the stiffened resistance and the german artillery slowed but could not stop the allied advance the eastern side of the salient from the marne to rem bore some desperate blows but did not give way as the pincers closed in at the top of the salient the german command appeared to go back to its original plan of attacking rem from the south this was the side on which british and italian troops were cooperating with the french and the german command got for its pains in that direction a counter-attack which narrowed the distance from battle line to battle line across the top of the salient the french menaced ferion tardonois the german base of supplies allied aviators bombed these stores the long-range guns pounded at them and what with these and the conflagrations started defensively by the germans the marne salient was a cauldron which turned the skies blood-red on july twenty fourth the ground gained all along the line averaged two miles the british southwest of rem made a damaging curve inward and the shove around the other two sides was fairly even on july twenty fifth one week from the beginning of the offensive the americans and french from the soissons side and the british and the french from the rem side had squeezed in the neck of the trap till it measured only twenty one miles the french arrived within three miles of ferion tardenois and although the german resistance increased again the evacuation of ferry and the removal of stores to fisme far up on the straight side were foreshadowed the road leading between the two supply bases was shelled incessantly and the difficulties of resistance within the fast narrowing salient became almost superhuman but the rear guard of the germans died to a man to quote the observers and the rear action held the allied gains to a few miles daily a definite retreat began on the morning of july twenty seven with what the airmen reported as an obvious determination to make a stand on the orked the forest of ferre was taken and many villages but the fighting was insignificant because in the language of the communiques our forces lost contact with the enemy possibly this is what the famous phrase of the lutendorf communique the enemy evaded us had in mind there was a certain psychological stupidity in this german decision to make a stand on the orkt it was on the orkt that slofe and foch made the fatal stroke of the first marne battle and the very name of the river inspired france while this retreat was in progress the swiftest of the battle the german communique read between the orkt and the marne the enemy's resistance has broken down our troops with those of our allies are in pursuit on the twenty ninth the germans crossed the orkt with the americans behind them the pursuit continued the american troops with french to the right and left of them forced the enemy to within a mile of the vesle where his halt had no hope of being more than temporary the brilliant charge across the orkt was done by new yorkers the fighting sixty ninth which refuses to be known by its new name of one sixty fifth edwin l james writing of this charge for the new york times said there is little doubt if any chapter of our fighting reached the thrills of our charge across the orkt yesterday americans of indomitable spirit met a veritable hell of machine-guns shells gas and bombs in a strong position and broke through with such violence that they made a salient jutting into the enemy line beyond what the schedule called for this american charge cured the germans of any intention to stay on the orkt the resistance after that first attack was sporadic and ineffectual village after village was reclaimed it became plain that the whole marne salient was to be obliterated and that the germans could not stop till they reached the thirty-six mile stretch directly from soissons to rem at which they had strong entrenchments one terrific stand was made by the germans at Serge just above the orkt 
it changed hands nine times during twenty-four hours with americans fighting hand to hand with the prussian guards Serger. was taken in the first push over the ort but a counter-attack by the prussian fourth guard division under artillery barrage gave them the city once these guards were in the city the artillery barrage could no longer play over it and to the stupefaction of the germans the americans rushed in and fought hand to hand till they cleared the town while the german guns were powerless time and again this process was repeated till at last the germans gave it up and joined the general retreat this counter-attack is believed however to have enabled the crown prince to reclaim great stores of supplies in a woods north of the village at the end of these two weeks of infantry fighting the artillery took up the task and the infantry rested for a day though on august two they made a two-mile gain the total of german prisoners for that fortnight was thirty three thousand four hundred the hideous fighting above the orkt between the americans and the picked german divisions continued for days with each day marking a small advance for the americans on august second the french regained soissons on august third the allies advanced six miles retook fifty villages and reached the south bank of the vesle american forces entered fizme the salient was annihilated on august fourth fizme fell and a great supply and ammunition depot became allied property the enemy was forced to cross the vessel and victory on victory was reported along the line which so lately had dipped into the nerve centres of france the second battle of the marne had been won the part of it achieved by america could not fail to stir her heart to pride and exultation though numerically the troops were few enough not more than two hundred and seventy thousand they traversed the longest distance of the salient from vaux at its lowest tip to fisme on the straight line their fighting called forth comment from french officers who had been through the four years of the war which could not be called less than rapturous they are glorious the americans rang through france clemenceau speaking of foch at the end of the battle to which the americans had contributed so much said he looks twenty years younger he had both found and proved his army of manoeuvre the story of this first battle's hero must wait though it will be long enough when it comes and can include something more heartening than that a boy from new england did thus and so and the army is thrilled by the heroic feat of blank of michigan probably the first death in france in which the whole nation grieved was that of young quentin roosevelt aviation lieutenant son of the ex-president who fell in an air fight in the preliminary to the battle on july seventeenth he was last seen in a fight with two enemy planes his machine fell within the german lines weeks later the onward allied army found his grave marked in english lieutenant quentin roosevelt buried by the germans an official dispatch from germany stated that he had been buried with full military honors colonel roosevelt made a brief statement quentin's mother and i are very glad that he got to the front and had a chance to render some service to his country and to show the stuff there was in him before his fate befell him the news of his death arrived just a few weeks after the news that he had downed his first german plane the simple sincerity of the statement and its courage gave an example to the mothers and fathers of fighters which no one feared they would fail to come up to and when the casualty list from the second marne battle came in every bereavement was stanched by the fact that they had shown the stuff there was in them certainly not the least in importance was the fact that they had shown it to the germans an official german army report was captured july seventh on an officer taken in the marne region after giving a prodigious amount of detail concerning the american army its composition destination and so on it appended the following opinion the second american division may be classified as a very good division perhaps even as assault troops the various attacks of both regiments on belle wood were carried out with dash and recklessness the moral effect of our firearms did not materially check the advance of the infantry the nerves of the americans are still unshaken only a few of the troops are of pure american origin the majority is of german dutch and italian parentage but these semi-americans almost all of whom were born in america and never had been in europe fully feel themselves to be true-born sons of their country End of chapter twenty two recording by gary b clayton
Chapter Twenty Three of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Our Army at the Front by Hayward Brown. Chapter Twenty Three, San Miguel. Historians and military experts are fond of taking one particular battle or campaign and saying, "This was decisive." It enables one to simplify history, to be sure, but often any such process is more simple than truthful. After all, every battle is to some degree decisive, and the great actions of the war are so closely connected with smaller ones that it is difficult to separate them. It is the fashion now to speak of the Second Battle of the Marne as the deciding factor in the war. Indeed, there is one school of strategists which goes back to the first Marne, and speaks as if nothing which happened after that really mattered. In this spirit, it is true that the great tide in the Allied fortunes which began at Chateau Thierry, and swept higher and higher until the Germans had been smashed in the Second Battle of the Marne, did put a new complexion on the war. The battle definitely robbed the German offensive of its threat. Paris was saved in all human probability, from ever coming into danger again during the course of the war. Nevertheless, it is far-fetched to take the attitude that the war had already been won in early August. It was evident by this time that the German army had suffered a great defeat. Perhaps a great disaster would be better. And yet other armies had suffered great disasters and grown again to power and success. The plight of the Germans was certainly little worse than that of the Italians after the German offensive, and yet everybody knows that the Italian army came back from that defeat to final victory. Morale is subject to miracles, and soldiers can be born again. There might have been combinations of circumstances which would have permitted the German army to recover from its fearful defeat and find again its old arrogance and confidence. Only it had no rest. It is fitting, then, that the men of all the armies who completed the downfall of the Germans in the marvelous campaigns at the close of the year 1918 should have due credit. Their work was also decisive. No one can tell what would have happened to the German army if it had not been subjected to the steady pounding of the Allied armies. No attempt will be made here to estimate the relative importance of the work done by the various Allied armies in the closing campaigns of the war. This is an interesting, although somewhat ungrateful, task for military experts. In this account, we are dealing simply with the fortunes of the American army. It might not be amiss to suggest that the final victories of the war were won by team play, and that in such combinations of effort the praise should go to all, just as the labor does. There need be no controversy, however, about the Battle of San Miguel. This was an American action. It was under the command of General Pershing himself, and his forces were made up almost entirely of Americans. The French acted in an advisory capacity, and we were dependent, in part, upon them for certain material. General Pershing, in his official report, says, The French were generous in giving us assistance in corps and army artillery with its personnel. We were also under obligation to the French for tanks, but here they were not able to assist us so liberally, because they had barely enough tanks for their own use. One of the surprising features of the saint Miel victory is that it was achieved with comparatively slight tank preparation. St. Miel represented the biggest staff problem attempted by the American army up to that time. It was, of course, a battle which dwarfed any previous action in the military history of America. Compared to the Battle of St. Miel, the whole Spanish-American War was a mere patrol encounter, and Gettysburg itself a minor engagement. With the force at his command and the weapons, General Pershing could have annihilated the army of either Grant or Lee in half an hour. Some idea of the magnitude of the battle may be gathered from the report of General Pershing that he had under his command approximately 600,000 troops, or four times the peace standing of the entire American military establishment before the war. It is difficult enough to move an army of that size, with its supplies and its guns under any conditions, 
but the plan for the saint michel offensive called for a surprise attack and it was necessary to make all the troop movements at night in spite of the vaunted efficiency of german intelligence there seemed to be evidence that their high command had little inkling of the magnitude of the blow impending or the date on which it would fall the saint michel salient had been so long a fixture in the geography of the battle lines that no change was expected in preparation for the offensive the first army was organized on august ten under the personal command of general pershing following this move the americans took over part of the line this became a permanent american sector pershing took command of the sector on august thirty at that time the sector under his command began at port Suset and extended through a point opposite saint michel then twisting north to a point opposite verdun the preparations for the offensive included in addition to guns men's and tank the greatest concentration which the american army had ever known in transport ambulances and aircraft most of the planes in action were of french make and some were flown by the french but there were a few of our manufacture for on august seven an american squadron completely equipped by american production made its appearance at the front operations for the offensive were minute as well as extensive it is perhaps worth noting as an example of the thoroughness with which the american army went about the job that no less than one hundred thousand maps were issued which showed the character of the terrain around saint michel with all the natural and artificial defenses carefully noted and some estimate of the strength in which the enemy was likely to be found at each point the army had six thousand telephone instruments and at least five thousand miles of wire so there was no difficulty in keeping touch with what the men were doing at every point the attack began at one a m on september twelfth the american artillery had been crowded into the sector to such an extent that the german artillery was completely dominated the bombardment lasted for four hours and then the troops went forward preceded by a few tanks but there were points where infantry went forward without the aid of these auxiliaries it was misty when the seven divisions in the front line sprang out of their trenches and thus helped to keep losses down indeed throughout the battle the resistance proved much less determined than had been anticipated although the bombardment had been short most of the wire had been cut there remained a few jobs however for the wire cutters and for other soldiers armed with torpedoes with one method or the other our men smashed what was left of the wire guarding the enemy first line trenches and then the waves came on and over there was little resistance in the first line for the germans in these positions were pretty well demoralized by the terrific artillery poundings which they had received and the sight of thousands upon thousands of americans rushing upon them from out of the fog for the most part they surrendered without resistance as the advance progressed resistance became stiffer at some points but the attackers kept pretty generally up to schedule or ahead of it thiacourt was taken by the first corps the fourth corps fought its way through nonsard the second colonial corps was not asked to make a very great advance but it had the most difficult terrain over which to work it had won all its objects early in the day a difficult task was also set for the fifth corps which took three ridges and then immediately had to repulse a counter-attack saint michel fell early in the day and in an incredibly short period a salient which had been in the enemy hands for almost four years was pinched out of existence everybody was delighted to find that in one respect the american preparations had been too extensive no less than thirty-five hospital trains had been assembled back of the attacking forces and there were beds for sixteen thousand men in the advanced areas with fifty-five thousand a little further back as a matter of fact less than one-tenth of these facilities proved necessary for the american casualties were only seven thousand and many of these were slight the german general staff always maintained that it had anticipated the attack and that its men were under orders to retire as the salient was of no strategic importance the last assertion may be true but there seems to be little support for the rest for the total of prisoners was sixteen thousand with four hundred and forty three guns the quantity of material captured was enormous in a single depot there were found four thousand shells for seventy sevens and three hundred and fifty thousand rounds of rifle cartridges 
Among the other assorted booty were 200 machine guns, 42 trench mortars, 30 box cars, 4 locomotives, 30,000 hand grenades, 13 trucks, and 40 wagons. The number of German helmets which fell to the doughboys was naturally countless. The attack was so completely successful and ran so closely to schedule that there were few surprises. A little group of newspaper men, however, were frank to admit that they had encountered one. Following closely upon the heels of the attacking troops, they came to a village which was being heavily shelled by the Germans. Accordingly, the newspaper men took refuge in a dugout until such time as the opportunity for observation should be more favorable. Coming from the other direction, a group of German prisoners entered the same village. They had surrendered to one of the waves of unrushing Americans, but everybody was too busy to conduct them personally to the rear. They had merely been instructed to keep marching until they encountered some American officers or doughboys who were not otherwise engaged, and then surrender themselves. When the shells fell fast about them, the Germans darted for the dugout in which the newspaper men had previously taken refuge. The correspondents were astounded and disturbed when sixteen field gray soldiers came tumbling in upon them. They could only imagine that at some point the Germans had struck back and that the counterattack had broken through. And the correspondents admit that without a moment's hesitation, they gave one look at the Germans and then raised their weaponless hands and cried out, Camarade! The perplexing feature of the situation was that the Germans did exactly the same thing, and a complete deadlock ensued until a squad of doughboys happened along that way and took the Germans in charge. Both sides in the battle were willing to admit that their foemen had fought with courage. While it is true that the first waves of the American army had an easy time, there was still stiff but ineffectual resistance by German machine gunners later in the day. Many of these men served their guns without offering surrender and had to be bombed or bayoneted. In a document by a German intelligence officer which fell into American hands much later in the war, a very frank tribute was paid to the extraordinary courage of the Americans. The German officers said that they seemed to be absolutely without fear on the offensive and must be reckoned with as shock troops, although they sometimes fought greenly. He reported, however, that American leadership was less impressive and stated that the American army might have gone much further if it had been more quick to take advantage of its early success. But this would seem to be a mere effort to whistle up courage in the German general staff, for a consideration of the territory which fell into American hands as a result of the attack shows some measure of its success. This comprised 152 square miles which was recovered from the Germans, and in this liberated district were 72 villages. And yet the importance of the battle can hardly be measured in territory regained, and much less in booty or in guns. This signal success of the American army in its first offensive was of prime importance, wrote General Pershing in his report to Secretary Baker. The Allies found that they had a formidable army to aid them, and the enemy learned finally that he had one to reckon with. Moreover, the pinching out of the San Miguel salient put the American army in a position to threaten Metz. This threat was one of the factors which caused the enemy to realize a few months later that further resistance could not hope to check the Allied armies for any considerable time. The divisions employed at San Miguel comprise many of our best units. Among the divisions engaged were the 82nd, the 90th, the 5th, and the 2nd, which made up the 1st Corps under Major General Hunter Liggett. In the 3rd Corps were the 89th, the 42nd, and the 1st Divisions under Major General Joseph T. Dickman. The 5th Corps under Major General George H. Cameron had the 26th Division and a French Division. In reserve were the 78th, 3rd, 35th, and 91st Divisions. The 18th and 33rd were also available. End of Chapter 23 Recording by Gary B. Clayton Chapter 24 of Our Army at the Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Army at the Front by Haywood Brown. Chapter 24 Mose Argonne Begins. <laughs> 
Having successfully accomplished one piece of work, the American army received as its reward another piece of work. The reward consisted in the fact that the second task assigned to Pershing's men was, perhaps, the hardest possible at any point in the line. Since 1915 the Argonne Forest had been a rest area for the German army. Everything had been done to make the position impregnable, and so it was, in theory. But the Americans broke that theory and took the forest. So confident were the Germans of their tenancy that they had built all sorts of palatial underground dwellings. Barring light, there was no modern convenience which these dugouts, although that is no fit name, did not possess. Some had running water. All the most pretentious ones had feather beds, and the big underground rooms were gay with pictures and furniture stolen from the French. The defenses of the positions in the forest included miles and miles of barbed wire, sometimes hidden in the underbrush, and again carried around tree trunks higher than a man could reach. There were high concrete walls to stop the progress of tanks, and deep pit traps into which they might fall, and machine guns were everywhere. The Meuse-Argonne campaign, which falls into three phases, reads far differently than the taking of saint Mihiel. Except in its early stages there was no grand running flawless offensive without a hitch worth mentioning. In the nature of things it could not be so. The Argonne was less susceptible to the laws of military strategy. Warfare in these woods became a struggle between small detached units. Much of the fighting took place in the dark and practically all of it in the rain. The American victory was a triumph of the bomb and the rifle, and perhaps the wire cutter should be added, over the machine gun. In many encounters the opposing units fired at each other from short ranges, and directed their fire solely by the flashes of the other fellow's machine gun. War in the Argonne Forest was a cat and dog fight, and Germany was destined to play the cat's usual role, though she clawed her hardest. And yet, though many of the phases of the Mose Argonne were primitive and elemental in their nature, sound strategy lay behind the campaign. General Pershing, in his vivid report, explains not only the necessity for the campaign, but the objects which he sought and gained. Saint Mihiel shook the confidence of the Germans, but neither that success nor those scored by other Allied armies was sufficient to batter the Germans into defeat. The German army, wrote General Pershing, had as yet shown no demoralization, and while the mass of its troops had suffered in morale, its first-class divisions, and notably its machine-gun defense, were exhibiting remarkable tactical efficiency as well as courage. The German general staff was fully aware of the consequences of a success on the Meuse-Argonne line. Certain that he would do everything in his power to oppose us, the action was planned with as much secrecy as possible and was undertaken with the determination to use all our divisions in forcing decision. We expected to draw the best German divisions to our front, and to consume them while the enemy was held under grave apprehension, lest our attack should break his line, which it was our firm purpose to do. Our right flank, wrote General Pershing in describing his position at the beginning of the battle, was protected by the Mohs, while our left embraced the Argonne Forest whose ravines, hills, and elaborate defense screened by dense thickets, had been generally considered impregnable. Our order of battle from right to left was the Third Corps from the Meuse to Malincourt, with the 33rd, 80th, and 4th Divisions in line, and the 3rd Division as the Corps Reserve, the 5th Corps from Malincourt to Valcois, with 79th, 87th, and 91st Divisions in line, and the 32nd in Corps Reserve, and the 1st Corps from Valcois to vienne le chateau with 35th, 28th, and 77th Divisions in line, and the 92nd in Corps Reserve. The Army Reserve consisted of the 1st, 29th, and 82nd Divisions. The American Army had no extended vacation after the victory at saint Mihiel. That action had hardly been completed when some of the artillery left its positions and departed for the Meuse-Argonne front. Saint-Mihiel began on September 12th. 
Just two weeks later the first attack in the long protracted Mozargon campaign began. The first portion of this offensive was by far the easiest. It was difficult to be sure, but the terrific hardships were still to come. One factor which mitigated the task of the troops engaged in the first attack was that again the Germans seemed to have been taken by surprise. The Americans moved very fast over difficult terrain. This was country which had already been sorely disputed, and shell holes were everywhere. In the places where there were no shell holes, there was barbed wire. As the attack progressed, the German resistance increased. Artillery was moved forward and machine guns seemed to spring up overnight in that much ploughed and harrowed land. Yet after three days fighting, the Americans had penetrated a distance of from three to seven miles into the enemy's positions, in spite of the large numbers of reserves which were thrown in to check them. Even a German communique writer would hardly have the face to maintain that the territory captured by the Americans was of no strategic importance. Every mile that Pershing's men went forward brought them that much nearer to Sedan and on Sedan rested the whole fate of the German lines in France. But Sedan was still many a weary mile away. The territorial gains in the onward rush of the first three days included the villages of Montfaucon, Exermont, Guercourt, Coisy, Sepsarge, Malincourt, Ivory, known to the Doughboys, of course, as Solid Ivory, Opinionville, Charpentry, and Verry. Ten thousand prisoners were taken. In spite of this great success, it was not possible for the Americans to drive straight forward. The country over which the action was fought was so bad that several days were needed to build new roads up to the positions which had been won. Even with the best efforts in the world, the moving of supplies was a prodigious job. The mud was almost as great a foe as the German guns. In the necessary law, the Germans, of course, rushed new troops into the sector to combat the American advance. Naturally, the lull was not complete. There was constant raiding by Americans to identify units opposed to them, and here and there in small local attacks, strategic points were taken, which would be of advantage in the big push to come. From prisoners, the Americans learned that among the divisions opposite them were many of the crack units of the German army. America was also represented by its best organizations, but under the constant losses incurred in attacks against strongly entrenched positions, units dwindled, and replacements were poured in. Under the circumstances, it was necessary to send many soldiers to the front who had been in training but a short while. These were mixed in, however, with veterans, and it should be said to the credit of these green men that in practically every case they upheld the reputation of the units to which they were sent. They were quick to feel themselves as sharers in the reputation of their new-found organizations. There was no element of surprise to help the American army when the attack began again in full force on October the 4th. Where progress before had been measured in miles, now it was counted in yards. Possibly it was even a matter of feet at some points in the line. Yet always the movement was forward. Weight of numbers and dogged courage proved that machine-gun nests of the strongest sort were vulnerable. The Germans counterattacked constantly, but such tactics were actually welcomed by the Americans as they brought the Germans into the open and gave our riflemen and machine-gunners something at which to shoot. The difficulties with which the Americans had to contend may be judged by the fact that, according to an official report, the Germans had machine guns in intervals of every yard all along their line. The Argonne fighting produced many actions more important than the rescue of the lost battalion, but hardly any as dramatic. The incident could have happened only in the Argonne, where communications with cooperating units was always difficult and sometimes impossible. Major Whittlesey's battalion, in making an attack through the forest, gained their objectives, only to find that they were out of touch with the American and French units with which they were cooperating. It is not true, as sometimes reported, that Whittlesey pushed ahead beyond the objectives which had been set for him. Nevertheless, he was so far away from help as to make his chances of rescue small. German machine guns were behind him. His men were raked by fire from all sides, yet their position was a strong one and they hung on. 
Soon their rations were gone. For more than twenty-four hours even their position was unknown to the American army. Eventually they were located by aeroplanes, and an attempt was made to supply them with food and ammunition. Even yet rescue seemed a long chance. The Germans thought the battalion was at their mercy, and sent a messenger asking Whittlesey to surrender. He refused, and the go-to-hell which has been put into his mouth as a fitting expression for the occasion, will probably go down in American history in spite of the fact that Whittlesey has done his best to convince people that he never said it. Several attacks were made in an effort to rescue the Americans, but without success, until a force under Lieutenant Colonel Gene Houghton broke through and brought the exhausted men back to safety. The last strongly fortified line of the Germans was the Crimehild, and the second phase of the Mose Argonne offensive had not been in progress long before our men were astride the line at many points. But there was still much desperate fighting to do before the Germans were completely driven from their scientifically perfect positions. The honor of actually breaching the line fell to the Fifth Corps, which entered the line on October 14th and drove the Germans out after some fearful close fighting. In the meantime, the continual pressure of the American forces was beginning to tell. Chatel Chehery fell to the First Corps on October the 7th. On the 9th, the Fifth Corps took Fleuville, and the Third Corps, after some desperate fighting, worked its way through Bioul and Cunel. By October 10th, the Argonne Forest was practically clear of the enemy. One of the important factors in the Argonne campaign was aviation. Aerial activity was great on both sides, since in no other campaign was observation so difficult or so important. Both sides did a great deal of day bombing, and during one such American foray the greatest battle of the air took place. The American expedition consisted of thirty-four machines. It was attacked by thirty-six Fokkers. Although the German machines are faster, the American squadron managed to hold its formation. Seven Fokker machines were brought down in the battle, and five American. All in all, the Mose Argonne campaign was one of the most remarkable in the history of the war. Its second phase, in particular, is sure to be a bone of contention for military experts. General Pershing himself declared very frankly in his report to Secretary Baker that he had purposely abandoned traditional military tactics in the campaign. The enemy, he wrote, had taken every advantage of the terrain, which especially favored the defense, by a prodigal use of machine guns manned by highly trained veterans, and by using his artillery at short ranges. In the face of such strong frontal positions, we should have been unable to accomplish any progress according to previously accepted standards, but I had every confidence in our aggressive tactics and the courage of our troops. Such strategists as oppose the theory of the Mose Argonne campaign will undoubtedly assert that American losses were high. In rebuttal, defenders of the plan of the campaign will say that the losses were very light, considering the nature of the fighting, and that the campaign shortened the duration of the war appreciably by putting the Germans into a position where they were compelled either to surrender or be overwhelmed. But whatever decision may be reached by the experts, there is no necessity of calling for testimony as to the part the American soldier played in this campaign. It seems fair to say that he has never shown more dogged courage or resourcefulness than in the fighting in the forest. End of section 24. Recording by Philip Gould.